and welcome to Dream Leapers with Harriet Cole. I am so excited to talk to you today. I met two wonderful women a few months ago. You know, it was in honor of National Friendship Day, and they have been friends for a very long time. Such good friends that during the pandemic and even before, they began to write together. Well, during the pandemic, they wrote a novel that is just so good. It's called Never Meant to Meet You. And I started reading and fell in love with this book, not just because it's a well-written novel, but because there are really important storylines about life, about race, about class, about religion, about just the way that we move through the world through the lens of two women who are very different from each other, but who have come together for many years in a close, close bond. So they are Allie Frank and Asha Humans. They are here to talk about their life, their friendship, and their new book, Never Meant to Meet You. So join me in welcoming them right now. Hi, ladies. Hello, hello. Hi, Harriet. Uh, I'm so happy to be with you. And like I said, we, we, we joined up when it was National Friendship Day, and that was some months ago. And now your book is out. It's hot <laughs> off the press. How are you feeling? Gosh, it's so exciting. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that, uh, you know, we, we've been writing for a while together. Our very first book, Tiny Imperfections, launched into the pandemic, right into the heart of it. <laughs> so all of our plans to connect with readers and to share our very first um, piece of work to with the world, uh, we didn't get the chance to do that in person. So now that Never Meant to Meet You is out, it's really an exciting time for us. So um, we're having a great time mostly connecting in person mm -hmm. um, with people who love books. Which is really <laughs> wonderful. So you have a sort of double whammy pandemic story that one book came out in the pandemic and one book was created during the <laughs> pandemic. I always ask people, what did you do during the time of quarantine, during the pandemic? And you know, for many years to come, that is still going to be a question for us. And this will be an incredible answer. So talk about, let, let's really go into the pandemic for a minute, because it was such a panic time for people. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like it was a thousand years and it's only a few months that people have been kind of tiptoeing out of quarantine and out of, out of a lot of fear of mm -hmm. being around others, even though human beings are supposed to be together. What was, what was that time like for you? May I jump in? Sure. You know, it, Harriet, we had so many emotions that in some ways we really had to silo them. So Asha had the emotions of not seeing one son graduate high school, not seeing one son graduate college. I had the emotions of, oh my goodness, my children ultimately were home for 15 months from school. Our husbands who had always not been home all the time. We're now home all the time. <laughs> Asha, I know the, that. Yeah, Asha and her husband were in the midst of like looking for a new house and figuring out, out what's the best, best avenue for her mom. And the pandemic hit. We were contemplating a move to another state. Then the pandemic hit. And then we had our debut novel launching into May of 2020, when everyone was just oh, trying no. to figure out how do we pivot everything that we do, how we live, how we work, how we relate. And then it was the spring awakening of 2020. And what did that reckoning mean for our country? And then Asha and I had this panic of, well, we don't want to be a one hit wonder with <laughs> tiny imperfections which wasn't even a wonder because it launched into the pandemic. But so we need to get in gear to write another book, but we're totally isolated and creativity comes from life input. Sure. And there was very little life input. So then there was also this, you just mentioned fear, but there's, there was also this fear of, oh my gosh, can we write another book? Is there anything to say when nothing, it feels like, nothing is going on except for doom and gloom. So we had a very early panicked 
feeling ourselves on the, you know, home, personal and work front in this new career we were trying to launch, um, you know, and all that brew does not, one would not think creates creativity, but somehow we were able to, to manifest a new story that we absolutely love. Wow. And, and the storytelling, as I mentioned on at the top, is so interesting because, well, I think the best writing is based on a lot of facts, you know, the environment that you're in and the relationships and the realities that you kind of sew into the storytelling. You two are one African-American, one European-American, very, very, very different backgrounds. And you build on characters with similar backgrounds to yourselves. So let's start with the reality. You two are friends. How did you become friends? <laughs> uh, we have both, each of us has been in education for over 20 years. And on our journeys, um, we began to work at the same school. All four of our children attended this school. And Allie was assistant head of school and I was the pre-K teacher. And we were both on the admissions team. So while we had a founder, the school founder was a brilliant educator mm -hmm. um, and was very serious about the business of giving our full attention to families and the children who came through our admissions process, Allie and I often need a little levity after those meetings. <laughs> so we would get together in my classroom kitchen and, and uh, you know, talk a little bit, a little less shop than what was required of us in our formal meetings. Things like, uh, gosh, did you see that one kid? He's wearing a pull-up, Allie. I can't take another kid in my class with pull-ups on. Or <laughs> do care how brilliant they are at the ripe age of three and a half. I can't do it again. <laughs> or, um, boy, uh, did you see the hot dad that came through? Well, who's his kid? We don't care. We don't care. Just we want the dad. We want the dad in our class. Um, you know, silly things that we, we have a, a similar sense mm -hmm. of humor and we would joke around. Oh boy, when I write a book, I'm going to put that in my book. And Allie would say, well, I, when I write my book, I'll put this story in there. And it was a, a, a moment of sharing cumulative stories from our decades in education, not just at that school, mm -hmm. but everywhere where we've interacted with children and families. And uh, after we each left the school to pursue our own um new sort of pivoting in our careers. Uh, Allie came up with an idea and gave me a call one day and asked if I'd like to join her on this journey. Wow. And it is, you know, we sort of operated, I mean, I guess me first from ignorance is bliss. Like we didn't know if either of us could write a book. We didn't know if we would get along writing a book. We didn't know, you know, when I said I want to write a book and Asha says, sure, I'll join you. We didn't know how much we were truly each committed to the effort. And it ended up being, cause you know, we do want to be honest to people who are like, oh, maybe I'll co write a book with um, someone. It was sheer luck and light shining on us that we just happen to both have the exact same work ethic. We're as dedicated to what we wanted to do and what we wanted to say. And randomly that Asha's strengths are by far my weaknesses and my weaknesses uh -huh. are Asha's strengths. So we joke as, you know, humanities ladies that we do bad math that one plus one equals one good writer. <laughs> But you know what, as a writer myself, I, I've never written with someone else. So first of all, I don't even, I can't even imagine what that's like because, you know, you have your own style and then your own way of thinking and then meshing that with another person. is It's just a fascinating idea. So can you talk a little bit about your actual process? Is it one writes a chapter or a paragraph or one writes and the other edits or yeah, how, how in the world does it work? Well, from the beginning, uh, it was apparent um, that Allie has this mind for story, a beginning and an end, and a few of the twists and turns off the path. And I have an affinity for the very small details. Um, 
making sure that our path is a precise one. Mm. Uh, and I fancy myself a little bit of an actress. I really love to get into the mind and the background of our characters. So meshing those interests together worked extremely well for our writing. Well, and I, before we go into the like details of how we do it, I would also offer up that, you know, like Asha said, between the two of us, we have 40 years in education. And that's 40 years of observing multiple generations of people. We are, I believe, and I believe Asha does as well, educators are the greatest observers and understanders of humanity because people are our job. So we've experienced so many people and types of people and you know parents and kids that developing characters is pretty natural because we have a lot to pull from. So I feel like that part hasn't been super challenging for, for us, but it's because we've never sat in an office. We've always been among. Right. People. So, but in our actual action of writing the book, because we do a whole lot of talking just about life, that probably if we didn't talk all the time, we'd get books written much faster, but all that <laughs> conversation contributes to what we write. But I usually get down a really ugly couple of chapters and put notes all over it for Asha. And then I send it to Asha and she goes deep on the people, the feelings, the expressions, the dial, the inner dialogues. Then she'll send me while she's doing that. I write a couple more chapters. She sends it back. So we call it writing leapfrog because it's mm. constantly, constantly me sending her something. She's sending it back to me. However, that's really just to get the rough part done. Asha and I are writing first about humanity and not first leading with race or religion or culture. So we want to be in total agreement with every word, every punctuation. So after we get that first ugly draft down, then we go to the process of between four and six times reading the book out loud. I love that. Editing every single thing. And we have to agree on it. We will stay stuck on a sentence, a joke, three words until we both agree. There's no that. like, oh, okay, you can have that one. Um, and then we keep going. So, um, we believe what we turned into our editor is a really well finished manuscript. But, you know, up front, it's a lot of slow work. But we can defend together and individually what we've put on paper by doing that slow work of reading and reading and reading together. That's amazing. I mean, when, when you think about friendship, because that's how you all started, very often in friendships, you have to give in. <laughs> you, know, you don't always come to consensus. I mean, relationships aren't necessarily like that. So in your writing process, you're saying that you come to consensus, you come to agreement for each word, each verb, each piece of punctuation. Did the writing process make your friendship tighter? Has it been tighter? <laughs> Some things that Asha's way better on. I don't <laughs> fight her on grammar. I'm like, whatever, whatever, you know, because she is the grammar nerd. So certain <laughs> things I do not have like a foot to stand on. Got it. <laughs> and then other things, yes, we're in total agreement. But there are some things I'm like, whatever you say, Asha, I'm in. And we do, you know, we're individual women. We have our own points of view and our own experiences, and they don't always jive. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we spend an afternoon trying to convince the other one, no, 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 this is how people of this certain age would say this. Well, no, 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 mm -hmm. I haven't had that experience. I think people of a certain age particularly in the California Northern region, would say it like this, we'll go to research, we'll back off, we'll ask friends, mm -hmm. we'll Good. sit with it for a while. 
and then we'll come together. And neither of us is a type of woman to give in <laughs> just to get along, especially for something that is a, a, a product of our expressions and something from our heart. Um, but we do our very best to find the best middle ground for our mm -hmm. characters and for each other. Mm -hmm. Well, it, so let's let's go to some of the challenging points that come up in the book that you really examine closely. One of them being race, and you know you two are of different races, and your character, the main characters are as well. You know, it's hard to unpack race. It's hard to mm -hmm. to first of all simply in friendships race socioeconomic status age family status all of these things are huge topics that philosophers have spent generations contemplating that that a lot of friends table certain things because they can't figure out how to get past it you know what we won't talk about this so that mm. we can stay friends we won't address politics so that we can <laughs> remain civil. You know, they're, they're just all, all these kinds of things. So, so as it relates to race, how did that conversation begin between the two of you, e even before it goes into the book? Um, one of my favorite quotes from Brene Brown is that, you know, um, empathy is comes from listening to a person and, and I'm paraphrasing here, but believing them, believing their story. And Ali and I both have, have approached issues of race, religion, class, privilege with the best of intentions. And if we make a mistake with each other, we got to talk about it. We have to understand how our characters feel so we can make them authentic. But it definitely comes from allowing each other this having grace to give each other the space and the time to come to terms with what we're learning. I think that's important. You know, I, I want to ask you, because I was just having a conversation about some of the subtleties of race and, and realities around race and conversations about them. These days, especially since George Floyd's murder and the, the unpacking of all that that means and, you know, the many conversations that have occurred, there have been a lot of discussions about uh, microaggressions and, you know, the kinds of indignities, particularly the African-American people have suffered for generations and continue to suffer. There has also been a lot more conversation about white privilege and yet, and so this is going to be interesting. See what you all think about this. I feel like the complexities around white privilege are not really what are being discussed. It's sort of a blanket. Oh, that person can't see anything because she's walking with privilege. Mm -hmm. She's blinded by reality because she doesn't have to think about it or he. I, I, I'll start with you, Allie. I'm very curious about your understanding of white privilege and the complexities of it. And you, you, you address this in different ways in your book, but can you speak to what does that mean to you today? Well, I think that for me, I have maybe a more atypical view of it because I'm white, but I'm Jewish. Right. And there is a layer and there's an assumption that if you're white, then you will never understand or be a participant in um, discrimination, persecution. And that's just not the case when you're Jewish. Right. And when you're Jewish, you also, I mean, anti-Semitism is centuries and centuries and centuries long, but it's swept under the rug. It's not recognized because Jewish people are white and it's not really discussed. So I have a deep 
understanding of white privilege from my time working in schools, because I've had, um, you know, I come from a loving family. I had great educational opportunities, but I also grew up in a rural area where we were the only Jewish family and the language that was used and the actions towards religion that most people had no concept of were a huge part of my experience in my life. So I do understand an element of being other mm -hmm. and having to stay completely quiet and not revealing my other because of what was being said around me. And so I just had to be quiet and live my life to get through to a different place. So I feel like on the outside, I recognize white privilege because I look like white privilege. Right. But I have a real um, heart and hurt for what it feels like when language and action is used against you. Oh, that's a very good answer. And, you know, I grew up in Baltimore, in, which has a very large Jewish population, as well as large African-American um, middle and upper middle class population, while that's not what's often talked about with The Wire and Homicide and all those mm -hmm. TV shows that make it seem like it's just poor criminals and drug addicts who are Black. But what I remember is that is a segregation that existed in my town when I was growing up. And even like my family likes to go to the Hamptons as a neighborhood there where there are a lot of black families go because years ago, the covenants only allowed black people to live in certain neighborhoods. And the same things were true for Jewish people. I think the difference in this case, the, the invisible difference is that it wasn't talked about that much about Jewish people. It just happened to be true. Mm -hmm. and But the discrimination was real. As it relates to what you just shared, visually, you pass, in a sense, because you have white skin. Brown skin, Black people like myself, like you, Asha, we don't pass. We're, mm -hmm. Nobody's going to look at me or you and say, oh, she maybe she's white. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen, right? So for you growing up, um, and you're from the West Coast, is that right? Yes. You. I'm so, from Seattle. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so yeah, I'm from Baltimore, very different, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, race history, civil rights history on the East Coast, not as much that we know of anyhow on the West Coast. There is this belief. I think it's a false belief, but there's a belief that it's like nirvana on the West Coast and, mm -hmm. and people and white people, you know, skip in circles and get along really well, even though we do know the Black Panther started in San Francisco. So we know it's not true, but part of us thinks that it is. What what was it like for you? What was race like for you as you were growing up in Seattle? Well, I think it's important to draw those distinctions between uh, or among the Black community, because none of us is a monolith of the experience. Sure. I am very different from a Black woman in the Southeast. I'm very different from a Black woman in the Northeast, mm -hmm. in the Midwest. Um, growing up in Seattle with such a very tiny fraction of this population is Black. I came across growing up um, plenty of white folks that had never interacted with black people in their lives. Wow. And that created, I feel, an understanding in me of if you don't know, how are you supposed to know? Mm -hmm. And I think it developed in me a certain amount of of grace with people's experiences. I have great friends who grew up their whole lives before they knew me, didn't know a single black person. And if I'm their first interaction, I felt okay with, with um, I don't wanna say letting things pass, but understanding the lack of knowledge, the ignorance that a person can just simply grow up with through no fault of their own, children cannot decide where they live, what neighborhood, what interactions they have. Their parents are in full control. 
And that was the age that I became familiar with other kids that didn't know black people. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking, you mentioned before the issue of microaggressions. I, yep. I began to very, very clearly be able to draw the distinction between someone who would say something because they knew no better and someone who was trying mm. to insult me. Mm. And I can deal with those accordingly. And I always did, but I would give grace to people who just didn't know. I would correct them and hope we could go on from there. Um, but growing up in this community shaped a different perspective for me. Um, I wasn't looking out for insults at every word spoken. There were a lot of insulting things that maybe someone would have picked up if they were from another neighborhood. But for me, I'd just be like, you know, we don't talk like that. And I'm your black friend. And if you say something to somebody else that's not me, you might get hurt. <laughs> so, you know, that experience definitely shaped um, how I write. Um, I had a, a dad who was involved in diversity and equity and inclusion work his whole life. So that shaped how I viewed race relations. Um, I had parents who were committed to community service that took me into other neighborhoods. I was part of a busing program. Seattle was the very mm -hmm. first and largest uh, public school um, community to desegregate without a federal court order. And that happened to be under the direction of my father. So wow. I was bused an hour away from home and an hour back. My mom was not happy with him about that. But how was it for you? How was it for you, Asha? How was it for me? Yes, busing. Um, you know, we had a lot of discussions about how people were different at the dinner table. It opened up a new world. I learned to sing We Are Family in Korean. Oh, wow. I had Chinese. Right, because there's a very large Asian population. Very Seattle, much. Right. Mm -hmm. Very much. I have a Korean Chinese friend who has been a friend of mine since I was seven. I would go to her house and eat kimchi. She would come to my house and eat grits. Those yeah, things man. impacted me greatly in the most positive way. And I'll take all the bumps along the road that I had to go over because they made me a, a more developed human being having those experiences. That's fantastic. I, I'd like to pivot to your book, Never Meant to Meet You. And I'd like for you to tell us what the book is about mm -hmm. so that we set the framework. And, and I'll just say, it, I believe that the main characters show us there, there was some uh, ignorance around race and privilege. So like you were saying, you, you deal with people accordingly. I think there was more ignorance than there was any kind of intentional mm -hmm. um, wrongdoing, thinking, or saying. And, mm -hmm. and so therefore, a lot of opportunity for growth. So can you set up, what is your book about? So our book is about a Black Baptist kindergarten teacher and a Jewish editor at a publishing house and their neighbors in the Rock Ridge neighborhood in Oakland, California. And they have kept to their own side of the driveway that they share with their craftsmen. And the part that is more out of ignorance, but is at the same time purposeful is that they can't imagine that they would have anything in common as neighbors. So there wasn't any animosity, it's just this, why bother? And mm -hmm. there is a unfortunate death in the neighborhood that brings these two women together who never thought they really needed to meet each other and get to know each other. And Asha and my intention in writing this book, like the, the big mission statement, which is really our mission in all our books, is to show people of different race coming together 
with the best intention and with a grace for what people may not know or may not have yet experienced. Just because you haven't experienced something by the time you're 35 or 45 doesn't mean there isn't still time to learn and grow and embrace. We should always be open to learning and growing and embracing. So we want to put out there to stay curious about people that are not just like you. We also wanted to write a book that, um, you know, just between these two women demonstrated subtly, but demonstrated there is a very strong history in the United States of the Jewish and the black experience supporting each other and in some ways mirroring each other. So we wanted Margette and Noah to have some representation around that, that longstanding history in our country. We wanted to explore the topic of grief and healing because that's what everyone was going through during the pandemic, whether it was, yeah. you know, so foundational of a loved one passing away to just, you know, grieving our, the change of our daily life and how do you heal through all that. And we wanted to continue explore, which we did in Tiny Imperfections and we do in Never Meant to Meet You, this idea of opening up stories about people of other races and religions of culture. There, you can learn through experiencing the drama and the trauma of their stories, but you can also learn by experiencing the joy and the humor and the laughter that exists when, within those races and cultures and religions, that the, and the understanding the joy is as important as understanding the trauma that's happened in the history of the people as well. Um, and that's kind of a tough thing to do right now in our culture where feels like everything needs to be hard and there's so much animosity and canceling out each other's voice that, you know, it's a little nerve wracking bringing humor into these hard topics. Sure. But we do believe that humor is an entry for people who may be too fearful to enter in other ways into the conversation. So why not do it with a smile on your face? You know, the the relationship between Blacks and Jews has historically been a pretty tight one. And in recent times, not so much. I think that uh, people have more taken sides, you know, gone on their side of the boxing ring, so to speak. And during during the pandemic, I remember you know, all these little flashes of incidents happened. Uh, there were uh, people in the hip hop community who made really outrageous um, anti-Semitic comments and it started this swell of, of uh, anger and hatred and hurt all over again. And, but, but one thing that I noticed was it was almost like cultural amnesia. People didn't know. A lot of people didn't know that our communities have been tight and in solidarity with each other over injustice. Um, curious, what what did you all observe on the West Coast? And um, Asha, you can start. Um, we, we certainly observed that as well, but Allie and I, while all of that was happening, while it is happening, we also searched for the solution. It's kind of like uh, Mr. Rogers used to say, whenever there's something really bad happening, look closely mm -hmm. because there are good people who are running in to help. And mm -hmm. that's who we looked for. Mm -hmm. And we did that intentionally. We could sit back and be an audience with our popcorn and watch all the drama happen. But we wanted to be part of the reminder that the vast majority of people who might not be yelling at the top of their lungs about the issues that they're seeing are still quietly being loving and caring and supporting every color member of their communities. We joined the Black Jewish Entertainment Alliance and um, it's you know largely an online group. It's sort of symbolic, um, but it includes 
actors, creatives, singers, comedians of all colors who continue to lend their voice to solidarity among especially black and Jewish people, but among people everywhere. So we wanted to turn our heads with purpose away from the hatred and look to see where we could lend our voices to the strengthening of the communities. And if I can just add a personal, a personal note, um, you know, with George Floyd and all the un unfortunate incidences that happened, you know, it was amazing because there was a swell in the country of wanting to learn, of having better understanding, of wanting to have better behavior. Now we can all argue, right? It ends and flows and progress really happens in small increments. But on January 6th, when it was the you know storming of the Capitol, there was a clip that played over and over and over of one gentleman that had a t-shirt on that said six million was not enough. I saw that. Yep. And that was never pressed, not on news, not on media, anywhere. But Asha noticed and Asha reached out to me. And, you know, that's a lot. That one person noticing when no one else really does. And that's what we're trying to do is notice those small things between two friends more so we're not going to be the writers that necessarily address like huge movements but the power that can happen when two people get to know each other and notice those small things for one another that's powerful and isn't that what it's all about it's it's one relationship at a time it's one moment at a time that we live our lives and how we treat each other is everything i want to talk about friendship you know, if you are very fortunate, then you're like the two of you. Mm -hmm. You strike a friendship with someone that lasts for a long, long time. I, I think of my mom, who's about to be 93 years old. Oh, and, congratulations. Awesome. Yes. And, and, and listen to this. She, she will be 93 next week. And she has a friend who has been her dearest friend, who is also 93. And they've been friends since they were four years old. Mm. I mean, who, what? And then she has other ones, one from when they were in the seventh grade and one from the ninth grade. Well, seventh grade and ninth grade are like 5,000 years ago when you're 93, right? <laughs> but, but she has these relationships. And we've watched them. And these women love each other and support each other. And now in their old age, one will finish a sentence for another. And if one's a little frail, the other one's standing in to buoy her up. What is it about your relationship that makes it so special and enduring? You know, we, we face hurdle a little bit in our storytelling for our for Never Meant to Meet You. Um, we kind of struggled with this idea of women making friends later in life. Allie and I didn't grow up going to elementary school together. We didn't hit the bars in our 20s. <laughs> well, we we, didn't, we're nerds. We barely hit our bar, the bars, period. That's true. But um, we didn't share. We didn't have our pregnancies at the mm. same time or attend each other's weddings. We were in our 40s when we met. You are and that's, us. I know what I gotta be, I gotta tell the truth. All right. Um, and that's unique for women. I think that we tend to sure. make these bonds early and keep the same girlfriends for a long time. And then later on, women often become acquaintances. But sometimes you come across a person that fills a need in your life and you allow it to grow to become even more than friendship. And that's what our characters, Margette and Noah, do in Never Meant to Meet You. And that's what Allie and I have done. We have gone beyond writing partners to become very close friends and to ultimately be 
found family for each other. Um, and in that way, it's very reflective of what happens in our book. Um, you know, what makes our friendship special, I think, is that despite the fact that we look different on the outside, we are very similar. Mm -hmm. We come from educators. Both of our um, sets of parents have been educators and very dedicated to racial harmony and community activism. Um, even as they and we grew up completely with, I mean, with miles between us, somehow we found each other in this realm of education and went from there. Well, and I, I would also add that, you know, I think an unfortunate part of female being female and friendships is there can be long standing sort of subtle competitiveness and not putting your full ugly and beautiful self into the friendship. And I've always struggled a little bit. I have an amazing group of friends, but they're cultivated because we're all very real and honest with each other. And I've never felt with Asha, and hopefully you feel the same way, that I had to hide anything about who I am or how I am or how I walk through the world. And that's true acceptance sure. of a friend when it's wholeheartedly who you are and what you are. And I feel that way about there's nothing Asha could do or say that would cause me to walk away because she's human and she accepts me and my full fallibility and you know, the same goes in reverse. Plus after 40, if you don't have some crazy in your closet, like you're boring. <laughs> <laughs> now that is true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you all have found each other and kind of worked through your quirkiness and whatever those things are to find a nice rhythm and level of intimacy. Have there been people in your family or close friendships who were not as welcoming as you are to each other? Hmm. Um, you know, I come from a multicultural background. There are blonde hair, blue eyed people in my family. I mean, I, I, my grandmother and I were probably the darker skinned ones. And we poke fun and tease all of them. It don't matter what color they are. They speak different languages. They come from different uh, socioeconomic groups. And it looks like a slice of the world when we sit down at a table together. So that experience made it very easy to be accepting of anybody who showed up and looked a little bit different. I think I was lucky that way growing up. Not everybody has that. I think it's a, a privilege to have had that type of upbringing. Um, and, you know, my husband happens to be white. My Doesn't happen to be, he is. <laughs> He, he is Did he have a choice? <laughs> <I don't think laughs> so. Last week he was purple. <laughs> um, you know, my sons, we always joke that they're ethnically ambiguous. You know, they've been mistaken for uh, Latin, Indian, all sorts of um, Southeast Asian. People talk to them in different languages when they get in an Uber or a cab. <laughs> and you roll with it. You have a choice to respond to what the world gives you with positivity or negativity, That's with true. a laugh or an anger. No one can make me happy and no one can make me sad. That's my responsibility to go through the world the way that I choose. And doing so with humor really keeps the wrinkles down. <laughs> So I feel like I've been nurtured to understand that I have a choice in how I react to the world. I can do it with my fists up or my hands open. And I choose every single day to do it with my hands open. That's beautiful. And Ellie, for you. Yeah. Because this I, is, yeah tell yeah, tell us your perspective. I'm a unique situation as well. So my parents were the first white teachers professors at Jackson State University in the mid 60s when it was an all black university. So 
they have the majority of their friends in those formative years of being in your 20s were all black. So, and were constantly, and most of them stayed in academia. So whenever they were traveling through um, the West, they always, you know, saw my parents and reached out, you know, just as much as you have make amazing friends later in life, those friends in your 20s before you had kids, when you were dating, you know, those are really formative friends. And then my parents wanted to have more kids and unfortunately they could. So my mom basically usurps all my friends. <laughs> so I was just telling Asha this because we're going over to see them tomorrow. I'm like, oh, my mom, I've, I've become her servant so that she can hang out with Asha. <laughs> and um, my cousins, I'm mostly male cousins on one side. They've all married black women. So in my family, in particularly in my generation, everyone's like, ew, boring. You know, you married a white guy. But then our children are actually, because we're Jewish and my husband's Italian, our kids are much darker in skin than my cousins who have Mixed children. Who are, yeah, and they're really light. And two of them are blonde, blue eyed. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. So, That's you know, so there's a fun. lot of like, comfort and humor about it within my family. And it's just, it's just sort of how now for two generations, our family has lived. So I don't think it's ever been an issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, well, a couple things. You're being very honest about your life, which is great. You know, there are plenty of people who are not, both of you. Uh, also, it may be a bit unusual that every one of your <laughs> Brothers married somebody black. That, I, I that might be unusual. Like, Does no one want to marry someone that looks like <laughs> me, the matriarch of my generation? That's insulting. That's, that's that's something. But you know, I just think about well, as you described, Asha, many black families. We just have every we we look every way. My mother is much whiter skin than you, Allie, and she has hazel eyes and straight hair. Her mother had blue eyes and straight hair and white skin. My father's very dark with curly hair. And we are everything in between. Mm -hmm. That's a common thing in, in black communities. It, I don't hear it as often in white families. Mm -hmm. And it may be that I don't hear it just because people don't talk about it. it. It may be more common than we know. You know what I mean? Just the, the, the thing about America is that we are so mixed. We are so culturally mixed. And that notion of the great melting pot, I actually don't like it anymore because I like when we claim all of the things that we are, as opposed to saying, okay, I'm part of the great melting pot, so I'm just American. What does that mean? Don't, don't quite know what that means, but I will say this. In Never Meant to Meet You, you explore with great loving detail what relationships are like, what that friendship supersedes everything, you know, that love is that glue that, that goes through relationships and helps to heal them. And it's so beautifully written. I'm, I'm incredibly impressed by your ability to write together. Maybe one day I'm going to try to do that. I haven't tried yet, but you definitely, I mean, it, it's, it's a really well-written book and I give you lots of credit for having worked so hard on it. It's not a little book either. A lot of pages, a lot of words, and many, many thoughts. Well, and I do, I do want to add that when you were just asking sort of how we're, you know, accepted or looked at, I will say when we did a, um, a lot of Zoom calls and book groups and that sort of stuff for Tiny Imperfections, there were a lot of comments from white women who after we talked and they, that we could tell that they wish they had a friendship mm. like ours with someone that didn't look like them, that someone had a different lens and different experiences growing up, that they were really hungry for that, less fearful yeah. of it, but actually hungry for it. And that was both encouraging to us, but also you know, a little sad that it's doesn't feel as available or doable for a lot of people. 
And so that what don't you think we felt that in uh, our Zoom calls? Definitely. And and on the flip side of that, I did um, a couple of because we respect uh, our book clubs, and sometimes they we had a book club. It was all black women. They wanted to talk to me. Yeah, they didn't um, want me there. We, we wanted a safe. They wanted a safe space to really lay it out. And we right. respected that wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And when I saw all those black women come up on that screen, I wish I could jump through it. Wow. I hadn't seen so many black women in one spot right. in my life yeah. in Seattle. That was all the black women oh. in Seattle. <laughs> I mean, I thought, when are you ladies meeting in person? I need to come oh, down yeah. there. It felt amazing through the screen. Mm -hmm. So um, this journey has given us an opportunity to not just share what we know, but to continue to learn from others and grow mm -hmm. and feel fulfilled and buoyed and encouraged by that as well. I love that. And I hope that as people are hearing your story, reading your book, hearing your story and, you know, kind of taking it all in, as long as we're alive, there's an opportunity to create these relationships. I mean, you know, I, I feel very fortunate. One of my dearest friends who is a white woman, I met the, my first job out of college. I hated that job, but I got her, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, she wouldn't be in my life. She wouldn't be my other sister if we hadn't been in that place. And I think we just need to open our eyes sometimes. Who are those people in our world? It's usually work. I mean, you all met at work. That's, we work. Yeah. It's usually at work. That's how we meet our spouses normally. And mm -hmm. that is how we meet our friends. And I would say to anybody out there who longs for a relationship like yours, open your eyes and find it, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's findable. I mean, even though yours is beautiful, it is not the only one. Mm -hmm. People need to know it is possible. And you are proof that it's possible. Yeah. So... Thank you so much, Allie Frank and Asha Humans. Never meant to meet you. It's a good book. Just out. I highly recommend that you read it. And in the back, there's some questions that'll get you talking. Um, you know, it, it, it is a book that is rich for discussion. So thank you, ladies. It's an honor to be with you and good luck on your endless tour. May it go on and on and on. <laughs> Thank you so much. We just want to travel. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, I, you can. So go for it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Dream Leapers with Harriet Cole. It's been an honor to be with you. I loved hearing Ali and Asha's story. I'm telling you, read this book. You're going to love it. Never meant to meet you. It's a novel, very beautifully written. And if you want to be a writer, you really want to meet it because it will inspire you to pick up pen and paper or type or whatever it is. And if you want to do it with a friend, know that it will work. Until next time, have a great day and make it count.